Victoria's high country is one of the most remote and magnificent places in Australia. But this alpine wilderness also holds dark secrets, disappearances and deaths that defy explanation. Look, it's as dark and mysterious and deadly as the ocean. Tonight, we'll investigate four unsolved cases that continue to baffle police. I just don't understand how somebody can disappear off the face of the earth. We'll reveal new witnesses. I was driving the bus and he staggered out in front of me. Shocking new evidence. As I approached, he started shooting at me. Two bullets in the head, one in the chest, close range. Four men who went into this mysterious high country. He's gone. He's gone. And never came out. It's not hard to hide a body anywhere up in the mountains. Were they accidents, misadventure? Uncontrolled shooting, escaped homicidal psychiatric patients, marijuana plantations. Or victims of foul play. Somebody knows what happened. Invariably, these things come to the surface. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, Alex Christich, former Major Crime Squad detective, now a high country hunter and founder of Wild Pro, protecting native Australian animals. Valentine Smith, 40-year veteran of law enforcement and the founder of the Missing Persons Network. From Melbourne, Narelle Fraser, former missing persons specialist with the Victorian Police. Bruce McCormack, the original man from Snowy River who knows the high country like few others. And Ian Veach, 27-year veteran of the Victoria Police Search and Rescue Squad who has first-hand experience in some of tonight's disappearances. Thank you all very much for joining me. Valentine, I'm going to start with you. Why is it that people can go into this section of Victoria and never come out? Well, there's a lot of different people going into the bush for different reasons and with different agendas. Some of them can be explained by uh, natural misadventure, something's happened, but there are crimes that happen out here. We know that, we've seen them. Last week, human remains found in the remote Wanangatta Valley were positively identified as being those of missing couple Russell Hill and Carol Clay, whose case we investigated last year. It brought final closure to their families and led to the arrest of this man, Gregory Lynn, for their alleged murder. But as we'll reveal tonight, there are other unsolved mysteries in the Victorian high country. Four men who disappeared within a 60 kilometre radius. Warren Meyer, David Prudhoe, Conrad Whitlock, Niles Becker. It's a wild place. The Victorian Alps or the high country is a wild place. Uh, there are places there where you, know, you can walk in and never walk out. It is Easter 2008. 57-year-old Warren Meyer and his wife Z are spending the holiday weekend in Victoria's high country. On the morning of March the 23rd, Warren sets off on a 10-kilometre bushwalk. For a man who has trekked the Kokoda Trail and to Everest Base Camp, it's little more than a Sunday stroll. He tells Z he'll be back for lunch. He belonged to the Bayside Bushwalking Club for many, many years, and safety was one of their paramount messages. You know, you never went out on a hike unless you've got a properly kitted out backpack. And that backpack he always took with him, even on that simple morning. He had everything there, you know, even down to a whistle, and he had food and water. And, he had a fully charged phone, a GPS. But there's no reason that he could have got lost. Instead, Warren simply vanishes. To this day, almost 14 years later, not a trace of him has ever been found. 
Valentine Smith. Of all the people to go missing, this is the bloke that should not have gone missing. He was so, so meticulous. He's only going for a four hour hike. He's got enough, uh, enough bush tucker to keep him going for two or three days. He's got three litres of water. He's got a, a thermos flask. He's got a Magellan uh, GPS tracking thing, mobile phones, everything you can think of. Whistles the whole lot and he's gone. He's gone. In the days following, Victorian police mounted an intensive search of the area. The family definitely needs some closure on this and that's what we're trying to help them along with that. Led by veteran search and rescue specialist, Ian Veach. All these roads were also searched. In the end, there was absolutely no trace. Did you find that odd? It was odd that we didn't find anything no equipment, no clothing. We didn't find Warren, obviously, or any of his possessions. In 27 years of policing, this is certainly one of the more bizarre ones that we haven't been able to find any evidence. Uh, Narelle, this is a man who was methodical. Do you also wonder then what we're left with? Well, I don't know the country like the other boys on the panel do, but I just don't understand how somebody can disappear off the face of the earth, especially when they are just so experienced. Bruce McCormack has ridden through this wilderness all his life. He knows how unforgiving it can be. He offers one grim clue on why many of those who go missing seem to vanish without a trace packs of scavenging wild dogs that roamed the high country. There's lots of wild dogs out there and, you know, you hate thinking that would have happened to him, but um, the, 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 they're a telltale story of things that are around the bush. But Warren's wife, Z believes the truth is more sinister. We believe he's the victim of some sort of foul play. He was too reliable. He was too capable. He should have been found on a track if anything happened to him or near a track. The family and friends, we searched for two years. The official searchers have checked tracks over and over. I mean, he could be there, but we believe that he could also be removed from the area because there's just nothing. A Victorian police investigation into Warren's disappearance failed to find any evidence of foul play. A coroner found his cause of death was unknown. But tonight we'll re-examine this most bewildering of cases, revealing critical evidence and witnesses, information that Valentine Smith, you believe, should lead to the reopening of this case. Absolutely. Looking at the risks that were in the bush that particular day, there's a greater probability that his disappearance could have been influenced by human intervention rather than natural misadventure. There were some serious risks in the bush at that particular time. Easter Sunday, March the 23rd, 2008. Highly experienced bushwalker, 57-year-old Warren Meyer, sets off on a 10 kilometre trek into Victoria's high country and never returns. With former Victorian Police Missing Persons Specialist Valentine Smith as our lead investigator, we're re-examining this concerning mystery. Easter 2008, yeah, I remember that day very clearly, actually. And with Valentine is a witness who has crucial information. His account of what happened the weekend Warren Meyer disappeared could reopen the case. Crazy shooting. It was just madness. Craig McDermott worries for his family's security but he knows that what he has to say is important. That's the Bicentennial Trail. In 2008, his property boarded the Monda track, where Warren's believed to have set off that Easter Sunday morning. The previous night, Craig had heard the disturbing sound of hundreds of rounds of high-powered gunfire less than 300 metres from his home. All of a sudden, we heard some gunshots start in the afternoon, and I wasn't concerned at first, but, um, 
It was only when they really started picking up, it was like, like, like in a repeating fashion, there was multiple guns. The gunfire continued through the night and into the next morning. Hundreds, wow. hundreds of shots. Uh, maybe one to 200 if I had to put a figure. They were high powered deer rifles or something along those lines. Valentine, this is a credible witness. Absolutely. He is certainly a very knowledgeable person in relation to firearms, hunting, uh, bushwalking, backpacking, serious hiking. He knew what he was talking about. Yeah, it was in this area just here. Craig believes so there were a number of shooters yeah, using high-powered centre-fire rifles with a deadly range of up to two kilometres. So the property was here, so I would have been standing about here mm -hmm. and you could hear the sonic booms going boom, boom, boom through the forest. Craig McDermott heard the shooting escalate, sounding out of control at about 9am. And it gradually built up and it went crazy. It, it literally went crazy again with multiple shooting and multiple guns for a good 10, 15 minutes. And then it stopped suddenly. So if I had to put a time on it, I think it was around 10 past, quarter past nine. And that was the end of it. No more, finish. Finished. Quarter past nine. It stopped. The critical question is, could Warren have walked into the line of fire? Well, it's possible. It's possible. And that shooting, it built up to a crescendo about 15 minutes before it just stopped dead, just stopped. No more. The centre fire rifles are, are capable of delivering fatal injuries at significant ranges. You know, you know, a couple of k's away, a bullet will kill you. You only need one round to kill a human. What is the range approximately from where they might have been shooting from to the track? Well, the Monda track, that's where the, the shooting was suspected to be. Either so he's on right the track, there. So right on top of it, yeah. He would have been on that track when that rapid fire was occurring. A high likelihood that he was on that track and the timings fit. We know Warren was almost certainly within the range of the shooting just before it suddenly stopped at 9.15 a.m because of a signal picked up from his mobile phone. His phone had pinged at a high point. Oh, yeah. Victoria Police Search and Rescue Specialist Ian Beach requested the mobile phone trace to confirm Warren's location that morning. That's something we do when it's grave or imminent danger for the person. It put that his phone from the Mount Gordon Tower, which is up near Marysville, it put him in a sector of about 120 degrees from that. And at 901, on the day he went missing, on that Sunday, his phone pinged once. And after that, it went silent again. So we know his phone was there. He was in the vicinity. Yeah, so he's come into the coverage and then he's gone out of the coverage. It's important information, but incredibly, police failed to further investigate this crucial aspect of the case. And he would have walked up here. They also he didn't interview Craig house. McDermott until seven months later, despite his detailed account of the shooting he heard. I've got to say, it all uh, seems to come together to me that there is something very, very unusual going on. I would think that sort of information you could not disregard. You would have to look at that, in a, especially in a case like this, where there's no reason this man went missing. Because it would only take one of those uh, shots to kill Warren Meyer if he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Absolutely. But if that had happened, Ian Veach is certain he and his police search team would have found Warren. Certainly if they'd accidentally shot him and he was lying there injured or dead, he would have been well within the search area that we covered. And so you'd expect to be able to find him or at least some of his possessions if that had been disturbed by wildlife. We had so many searches, up to 195, that we were able to send out teams of between five and 10, where they'd be walking through the bush, being able to see their feet of the person next to it. That was the instructions. If you can't see their feet, you're not searching properly. So we would have expected to turn up something. Investigator Valentine Smith also finds it suspicious that the wild gunfire stopped suddenly at the point Warren is presumed to have been on the track. Why did it stop so suddenly? I want to know. 
I want to know what, that's communicating a question to me and I don't have the answer to that question. They could have run out of ammo. Well, they could have, that's right. But I want to know. Would they have known if they'd hit someone? Oh, look, I, I, I would have to say they probably, they nearly would have to, to stop that quick. Um, otherwise, why would you stop that quick? You'd also have to say if they ran out of ammo, like Alex is saying, that would mean that they've all run out of ammo at exactly the same time. That doesn't gel with me. It was a fire pit or something? Yeah. When he felt it was safe to do so, Craig McDermott went looking. He found a burnt out fire and plenty of empty beer cans. And there were some old tinnies and stubbies and all that in there as well. But it's what he didn't find that's most curious. The shooting and their drinking or whatever, you would think that there'd be some bullet cases around the campsite, would you think? You, know? you really would for the amount of shots I heard. And that was my natural curiosity, I guess. After they all left, it was a few days later, I walked down looking at the ground trying to find bullet cases. At the campsite? I did. Yeah, and, and I couldn't find anything. So let's explore the scenario. The shooting stops abruptly because they think they've hit someone. So what do they do? We know that people uh, that do the wrong thing um, do remove the evidence to somewhere else. We've seen that in recent cases, in, in bush scenarios. Um, so it does, it does happen. They're breaking the law by shooting here. So I think they're panicked and they've done one of two things, I think. They've either taken Warren and, they're, and they've moved him into the bushes or they've come back at a later date and they've buried him somewhere around here. Bruce, well, you've listened to this scenario. If you had to dispose of a body, how hard is that? Oh, look, it's not that hard at all. You can take a body um, somewhere and dump it anywhere. And it's not hard to hide a body up in the mountains up there at the moment. Our investigation into the mysterious disappearance of veteran bushwalker Warren Meyer in Victoria's high country has revealed the presence of rogue gunmen in the area he went missing. Our experts believe it's possible Warren was shot and his body removed. In 27 years of policing, this is certainly one of the more bizarre ones that we haven't been able to find any evidence. But we've discovered there was another danger Warren Meyer may have faced that tragic morning. Anthony Williams was an escapee, a psychiatric patient. Williams was diagnosed as having homicidal thoughts. Anthony Williams, we know he was at the lowering gear track off the Akron Way at 10 a.m. on the 23rd of March, the same morning as Warren was in that same area. According to missing person specialist Valentine Smith, police investigators ruled out Anthony Williams as a suspect based on incorrect information. The initial police investigation uh, did a calculation on his time and movement and discounted any possibility of him meeting up with Warren based on a one hour time frame. That time frame was incorrect. Anthony Williams was seen in the area on the afternoon of Saturday, March the 22nd. The following morning, Warren Meyer was at this car park near the bushwalking tracks at around 8 a.m. Anthony Williams was next seen here at 10 a.m., giving him ample time to have encountered Warren. It was two hours, and there's no question about that. It was a two hour time frame which would have left Anthony and Warren a window of opportunity of from 20 to 30 minutes at least to have connected somewhere on that trail in that country. So it was definitely a possibility. It's certainly something you can't discount. Former Major Crime Squad detective Alex Christich calls the high country home. His property is close to where Warren Meyer disappeared and where he may have encountered Anthony Williams. You've got a guy there that has got psychological issues and he's made reference to wanting to kill people or had homicidal tendencies, and he's within, what, an hour's walk of where a man's taken off. 
It's certainly something you can't ignore. Uh, Narelle, you would be compelled to investigate that? Absolutely you would. You would not be, you shouldn't be a detective if you don't go looking down those rabbit holes. But because of their incorrect timeline, police failed to include Anthony Williams as a suspect. Williams died in 2009. There is yet another compelling clue in this concerning case. The discovery of marijuana plantations in the area where Warren went missing. His wife, Z says the plantations were found during both the police searches and those conducted by her family over the next two years after his disappearance. There was a, a small marijuana plantation found by the police in that first search. It was only 32 plants, but actually a street value of $70,000. But in the following January, uh, the family came across a huge cleared area that had remnants of a crop and paraphernalia scattered around in the bush. I think sometimes these plantations, are, I think you said it, that, that sometimes they're booby-trapped. They're, they're prote highly protected. It's not uncommon. Look, just in this short period of time, we've been able to establish, you know, people with guns in the area, people growing dope in the area, unstable people. There are a lot of things in play here that could have been, uh, you know, involved in the scenario of, of the man disappearing. What Warren Meyer was walking into that Easter Sunday morning is hard to comprehend. Imagine this. Warren goes up to the car park, parks his car, and there's a big warning sign. And it says, beware of uncontrolled shooting, escaped homicidal psychiatric patients, marijuana plantations and itinerant criminals in this area. Would he have got out of his car? No. Yet that is what he walked into. That's right. It's like walking into the perfect storm, isn't That's it? it? Warren's wife, Z pushed for a coronial inquest into her husband's disappearance and presumed death. She didn't get one, but the coroner did investigate. But when he finally handed down his findings in late 2017, it was a bitter disappointment. In particular, his statement that there was no evidence to suggest the involvement of any other person in his suspected death. It took 10 years to get a coronial finding and I can't see that we can have another inquest unless there's something substantial that may come in the future. Someone stepping forward and saying what they know. We've investigated the baffling disappearance of Warren Meyer in Victoria's high country. But is his case part of a pattern of death in this alpine wilderness. After Warren vanished in 2008, three other men also went missing without a trace. You the first was 39-year-old Niles Becker, an experienced hiker who spent six months training for a gruelling five-day trek through the high country. It was a birthday present to himself. On October the 24th, 2019, Niles set off, texting his family over the next three days. Everything was good, he told them. Then he vanished. Narelle, from your perspective, would you be thinking as a detective, not another one? Yes, I think I probably would. He's not just somebody that's gone for a bit of a wander through the bush. Former detective and missing persons expert, Narelle Fraser, believes it's too easy to blame disappearances like Niles on the wilderness itself. It's the same scenario. We've got a very experienced bushwalker. He's done his homework. He's planned this for so long. He's very um, organised. He knows what he's doing. And he just, again, disappears off the face of the earth. It's the same as Warren. It's what links all our mysteries tonight. The complete absence of any evidence, not one body or any belongings. How likely is it for absolutely no trace of a young 39-year-old man, Ian Veach, from your experience? 
Look, you can get four seasons in one day up there, even during summer. And there's several ways off there. There's steep ways and there's even steeper ways and there's deadly ways. You walk yourself into death. People are picturing that there's actually a track there. In most cases, there's no track. It's all, there's fallen timber, there's regrowth, there's you know, landslides, landslips. So you're talking about some pretty, pretty serious wild bush. Yeah, he's texting for three days saying all's good. He might be, but you slip over on one of those precipices or uh, off a drop off somewhere, it's game over. We just come down from there last week and that's life and death stuff up where we've just been. With his knowledge of the country and the treacherous alpine weather, high country bushman Bruce McCormack agrees Niles Becker has most probably fallen victim to a hostile environment. You might have trained for it, be at his best and that, but you have to be better than your best to go through that sort of stuff. Honestly, you, you, if you're heading the wrong way, you're three or four hundred foot drop and, and you don't know it till, you, till you're there. The Niles Becker case has never been solved, nor has the strange disappearance of adventurer and businessman Conrad Whitlock in the high country just three months before. It's July the 29th, 2019. 72-year-old Conrad Whitlock leaves his home in Melbourne at about 3 a.m. and drives towards Mount Buller. His car is found on the side of the road at a tight hairpin bend just six kilometres from the summit of the mountain. Hiking through Mount Buller's bushland and searching from the sky, specialist police look for Conrad Whitlock. No trace is ever found of Conrad. His wife Mandy can't explain why her husband stopped at such an unlikely spot. The tail of the car was only a metre or so off the road. And to me, that was unusual. It was like he stopped suddenly. If he'd really intended to park properly, he would have pulled right off the road. It just seemed strange because one more turn up the road and there's the great big um, maintenance area where they park the uh, snow clearing machinery. It just seemed really, really strange the way he stopped and where he stopped. Ian Veach, does this case seem a little odd in terms of just how this car was found? It certainly is strange that it wasn't parked properly, but also on a hairpin bend, he left all his equipment in the car. So it's, it's very strange. Had he gone off the side of the road and walked himself further into trouble, you'd expect at some point he would have stopped or been located. So it's like, where has he gone? Has he been, has there been any human interaction to, um, to get him out of there. The other thing is, if if he put the car there, what was he thinking at the time? If there was some sort of um, erratic mental thinking in relation to that? Maybe something has happened um, from a psychological point of view. Conrad had been having these headaches and I believe that he'd been looking up on the computer about amnesia and about uh, MRIs and scans. On the day of Conrad Whitlock's disappearance, Bruce McCormack was driving a bus on the same Mount Buller Road. I saw the car when I first came up the mountain about eight o'clock that morning. An hour later, Bruce was on his way back down the mountain. 10 kilometres past Conrad's abandoned car, he encountered a man stumbling along the road. I was driving the bus and he staggered out in front of me. Can you describe him? Did, did it fit the description of Conrad? Yeah, he's, he had grey hair and uh, a, a grey shopper jacket, but when you're driving a bus along the road, someone staggers out in front of you. And I didn't have a lot of time to sort of take, it was more interesting to see where I was going to end up, if you know what I mean. Oh, an extraordinary moment, I can understand. Um, but when you, when you think back, uh, the man that you saw do you think he was distressed? I thought he was just drunk because he just staggered out on the Bitchman Road, he was walking on the side of it. So that's, yeah, he just looked a bit uneasy on his feet and I didn't know whether he's going to keep coming across the road to me or not. Bruce reported his encounter to police. 
His description matched Conrad Whitlock, except the clothes he was wearing. No trace of Conrad was ever found. Who the man was on the mountain that day remains a mystery. Well, if Warren Meyer and Niles Becker were fit and experienced hikers, then Victorian prisons boss David Prudhoe could have written the book. He loved the outdoors, hunting, camping, exploring, and had trekked the high country countless times. But on June the 5th, 2011, while on a deer hunting trip, the 50-year-old disappeared. Prudhoe had his rifle, a GPS device, a UHF radio, a thermal blanket, and a backpack full of supplies. And just like the other cases we're investigating tonight, not a trace of him has ever been found, despite a full-scale search. Former detective Narelle Fraser has looked into the case and believes it is highly suspicious. David was the governor of Barwon Prison. That's a red flag to me because prison is full of very, very angry people. I think David would be, as prison officers unfortunately are, very unpopular. So are you coming from a place of uh, there was a motive, potentially, and therefore he has been uh, murdered? I am trying to keep an open mind about it, but it is certainly a possibility. I think he's got more of a motive to um, be murdered and taken off the mountain than any of the others that we've spoken about because of the position that he held within the prison. Again, there is absolutely no trace of David. This is a man that could not have easily disappeared. That's true. Search and rescue crews combed dense bushland where the 50-year-old from Sunbury was last seen on Sunday morning. Ian Beach, uh, what do you make of this uh, location where David Prudhoe went missing? The area where David went missing is certainly inhospitable and steep, but again, with all the equipment he had, it doesn't seem likely that he wouldn't have been able to camp for the night and um, summons assistance. He had a firearm, he could have fired a shot to get attention but certainly that area was well searched as well. Whether he's walked out of the search area um, or been taken out of the search area, it leaves that open ending to what has happened. Do you have an uncomfortable feeling about this case? It's probably one of the more intriguing because of his background and that there could be scenarios that people don't want him around anymore. Certainly it appears that he's not likely to be in the search area or we would have found some of his equipment as well. Everyone's talking about being surprised that he wasn't found. And that's absolutely correct, because most people are. So that's what the statistics say. That's what lost person behaviour and all the data across the world says that most people are found. So he's one of a very small percentage that's not found. And that's what we've got here tonight. Four people who went in and never came out. That's right. Four men who vanish without trace in Victoria's high country. In the darkness we roam. Foul play or misadventure are. in this alpine wilderness. We wait. If our investigation of Warren Meyer's disappearance has raised deep suspicions and given added weight by the vanishing of Niles Becker, Conrad Whitlock and David Prudhoe, then our next case can leave us in no doubt there are dangerous people in the high country. It's February the 18th, 2017, and 72-year-old Kelvin Tennant is riding his motorised bike along a high country trail. What happens next is like a scene out of a Hollywood horror film. I saw a car parked right up with its rear bumper, right lined up with the edge of the bitumen trail. And I didn't take any notice. I saw the, a guy get out and walk to the back of the car. And I slowed down as I approached and um, he was hiding near the back wheel of his car. And as I approached, he started shooting at me three times. Each one of them hit. One just above the ear, which did incredible damage to my hearing. Uh, another one in the chest. The police have that bullet. Another one came through here, I'm told. 
I think of all the stories that has raised the hairs on my neck, Alex. This is a case that shows us there are very dangerous characters in the high country. Well, there definitely are. Look, in this particular location, um, you, you certainly wouldn't expect something like that to happen. Whoever it was that, that, that engaged that gentleman did, it, did so with an intent to kill him. No problem at all. You know, any, anybody that's trained or that has a, a knowledge on how to kill people using a handgun knows it's usually multiple shots to the head and uh, other shots to the, to the torso to ensure that that person's dead. So he's lucky to be alive. He is extremely lucky to be alive. I interviewed Calvin and I tell you what, I pretty well had PTSD by proxy. Blasted three times at point blank range after cycling past a stationary sedan. This case is so shocking and the intent to kill so clear it raises the possibility of a psychopath using the cover of the high country to get away with murder. Who are we talking about here? The offender was obviously somebody that was hell-bent on killing. That person has set himself up to kill an individual. Psychopath? Psychopaths, generally, they're a little, probably a little bit tidier than that. You know, he's, he's put his car out pretty well for everybody to see. He set himself up in a position where he's laid in wait, waiting for the right person to come along and then shot him. But who is he? Because he's never been caught. Who knows? Why would anybody want to kill a 72-year-old ex-school teacher riding his push bike along a bike trail? The man who tried to kill Kelvin left the area of the Myrtleford Everton Rail Trail in a dark-coloured sedan and it's unknown whether he is in any way connected to the other high country disappearances we're investigating. Well, the truth of the matter is, and there's a lot of bad people around. Tonight, we've investigated four mysterious disappearances. Warren Meyer, Niles Becker, David Prudeau, Conrad Whitlock. Cases that remain unsolved that deserve closer attention. How you can have four men just disappear off the face of the earth. In our game, we call it, it smells, and it does. The evidence revealed tonight begs further investigation, and in our opinion, the need to reopen the Warren Meyer case. Valentine, do you agree that uh, Warren Meyer in particular requires some closer examination? Yes, I do. In the risks that Warren came up against in the bush at that particular time, there was a greater uh, degree of human intervention than what there was uh, natural misadventure. As a risk, it's on those shooters. Three times more risk from the shooters, we believe, than human intervention, any element of human intervention. We know there were gunmen in the area shooting hundreds of rounds from high-powered rifles. Evidence, including Warren's mobile phone signal, places him potentially within their lethal range. There were marijuana plantations near to where Warren was believed to have hiked. We also know Warren could have come into contact with a dangerous escapee, psychiatric patient Anthony Williams and that while investigating that possibility, police were working on an incorrect timeline. Police and coronial investigations determined Warren Meyer is dead, but neither were able to say how, why or where. Warren's wife, Z believes those questions can be answered if someone comes forward. Warren's story has no ending. And as human beings, we need to have an ending. Warren deserves to be brought home with dignity. As it stands, he's lying cast away somewhere. Um, how can we live with that? You know, we all only have one life to live and our last 14 years has been a hell that is beyond imagining. And I feel there are people out there who probably are carrying guilt. And if there is someone out there that really does know something, we urge them to come forward and help us, help us find some peace, help us bring Warren home. You know, this might be the last roll of the dice for us, but if there's someone out there, please come forward and help us. 
somebody must know something. Think of the trauma and the grief that the family are going through and please come forward if you know anything. Uh, Bruce, this is your backyard. It's your territory and uh, it, yeah. you've got a vested interest. Very much so. It's just not, not a good thought to think that you go up to that area and maybe there's a, an issue that you mightn't come back. It's a beautiful place to live and, and do, do whatever we do up there, but not, 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 not shoot people or kill people. And Ian, uh, no one searched harder than your people for Warren Meyer. How important is it, do you think, to get to the bottom of this case? Well, after 27 years of policing, it's certainly one of the most baffling ones, the one I'd like to see resolved. Certainly for all the people involved in the search, but for Z and her family, so they can get closure, because ultimately, if we can return Warren to the family or get some closure, they can start to move on with their lives. Well, somebody knows what happened. All they've got to do is pick up the phone and ring the police. It only takes one person to come forward for a case to be solved. And our lead investigator, Valentine Smith, believes that's what is now required if we're to find out what happened to Warren Meyer. Valentine Smith, you invested enormous amounts of time and energy. You've done the possibilities and the probabilities. What do you believe has happened? Based on the probabilities, we've analysed all of the elements that contribute to the case, the environment, uh, Warren himself and other influences. And I'm of the opinion that the greatest risk to Warren at that particular time was those shooters. Well, if anybody knows anything about the disappearance of Warren Meyer, Niles Becker, Conrad Whitlock or David Prudhoe, we implore you to call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. I want to thank you all very much for joining me and I want to thank you. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes, and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips, and don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.